you, you paint a very clear picture, and thank you, it's, it's very helpful, of excess deaths and the real numbers uh, depending so very much on this issue of whether you die with it or of it. Uh, and it begs this question, doesn't it? I mean, it, it would be very easy to say, oh, well, look, you know, uh, not only have we saved a lot of people from COVID-19 by lockdowns, we've saved all the other excess deaths that would have occurred. Uh, the problem with that is, I mean, that is, that, that is like saying, well, let's close the economy down uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, that's a good thing to do, notwithstanding yeah, yeah. The, the disastrous downsides. I mean, surely, to take a very simple example, we know that if you stopped everybody driving all motor cars, there would be no road deaths. But nobody suggests for a moment that we stop all motor cars. We recognise we have to take a balance. That's not to say that we take a cheap view of life at all. Yeah. It just means if we approach things in a pragmatic and sensible way and accept, there are always going to be dangers. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. You know, there's another aspect here that... Uh, uh, in, in uh, nationalized health systems where you people are covered essentially under insurance, uh, they have a very clear indicator of uh, you know, useful years of life. And I know that in the United Kingdom, um, you know, they're prepared to pay something like, let's just say, for example, 40,000 US dollars, it might be 30,000 UK pounds, for one, you know, for doing a measure that gives you one more useful year of life. Now, um, this basically means that there's a way to evaluate, you know, a useful year of life. And part of this measure is it takes into account disabilities. Uh, it also takes into account age. Uh, and in this measure of useful years of life, if you die above life expectancy, unfortunately, it's not counted. Now, this might seem very harsh. But, you know, I'm 73 years old, and if I want to get life insurance, no one's going to insure me. I mean, they might insure me at a premium that is so high that I would probably do better putting the money into a bank account. Um, so why is that wrong? Um, you know, be, this, there is a measure of life, years of life. And, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that every death is a terrible loss. But we have a lot of death anyway, and no one has a way to postpone death. And my, what my concern is, and I, I, I was very taken by what you said about who is bearing the brunt of the damage. And, you know, for, for each person, okay, you can make the following one. For each person who is kept alive at great expense, say, over the age of 85, it's a zero-sum game. We don't have infinite money for healthcare. And it's probably causing the deaths of younger people from disadvantaged areas who are not getting the health care that they should be getting. Now, you know, you might say, okay, it's okay in the United States if I'm, pay, you know, if I'm a millionaire and I'm paying for that. But in countries where they have some kind of socialized medicine, in America, they do have Medicare, which is a, a form of socialized medicine. You're basically, you think you're, it's, it's, a, it's not a zero-sum game. For each person, you know, I, I remember thinking about this. There was a, a case in the United States uh, probably 10 years ago, a, a lady whose name was Terry Shea was kept alive, uh, she yes. was brain dead, against her family, and Congress actually intervened. And I thought, you know, it, it's great to say that life is sank, but for each day that she's kept alive, I bet a few hundred underprivileged kids are dying. So what we're saying is it's not life sanctity, it's old people's sanctity. And, you know, I think in a very strange way, and I, 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 I'm 73, my mother's 105, she's locked down in London. So I, I'm, I'm very aware of being old. But I also feel that uh, the baby boomer, I'm a generation that has been rather selfish. We think we're the greatest. We think we have the best music. I imagine you're a similar generation as I am. I was born in 47. Uh, and as a result, I actually feel that it's very selfish of me to care so much about my own life and the life of my contemporaries and not worry about the livelihood of young people because economic, uh, economic stress causes suicides. It causes murders. Uh, I know in Israel, as soon as the lockdown was relaxed, the amount of domestic violence shot up. The amount of pedestrians killed on the road shot up. And of course, these are younger people. If you count years of life lost. You know, one person in a road accident to the age of 20 is like 
60 people who die one year younger than life expectancy by this measure of, of, of years of life lost. So I think it's, it's very unfair. I also think we're, 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 the lives we're saving by lockdown are, are not necessarily, you know, the young lives. Maybe they are. I don't see any sign of that yet. We're actually saving a lot of the older lives um, and at a huge cost. I mean, way more than the $40,000 per useful year of life. I, people have estimated that the if you take the uh, global cost to the economy and divide that by the total excess deaths from COVID, the price we've been paying is colossal. I mean, quite colossal. It's, it's, it's many millions of dollars per life saved. And, uh, you know, we can't afford that. So I... Yeah. Well, we won't be complete. paying it. We won't be paying it. Our children will. It's, can we move to... So what worries me is the real chance that there may be, in keeping with previous patterns, a second or a third rollover. We can't go through this again. We cannot do yeah. it. There's no way Sorry. that we can build up even more public sector debt with a whole new round of lockdowns. And it would be bad public policy. And I don't think populations, pop, I don't think the Australian people would wear it again. Yeah, I, I, I would say the following. I, I think, firstly, we always need to remember that COVID, by and large, has had the same burden of death as seasonal flu. And you therefore need to ask, I mean, besides saving lives in, in traffic accidents, you could argue it because the number of deaths from seasonal flu is way higher than the number of deaths from traffic accidents and actually less justified because we need to we need to drive cars. So in principle, you know, if, if we really wanted to, we could reduce influenza deaths, uh, for example, by having very strict rules for nursing homes and so on. Uh, and remember, half the deaths, certainly in the Western world, are for people in nursing homes. The reason being that the carers are all young, the carers don't stay in. Uh, nursing homes would cost five times as much per person if we didn't uh, do them the way they are now. So I think we need to take our acceptance of influenza as the yardstick. This is no worse than influenza. Now, let's, it's, you know, where it is actually worse for influenza, and I did try to make this point on Twitter, is for healthcare workers. Uh, healthcare workers are smart. They all take flu vaccine. For COVID, they didn't have a vaccine. Not only that, there was huge public expectation that they become heroes. And uh, I think many of the people who ended up being on ventilators, I think the survival rate of, of a ventilator was dismal. It was at very best 50%. And I've heard in some cases only 20% who went onto a ventilator were, were, were survived. So maybe it wasn't worth it. A lot of people have said that going to hospital is a bad idea because eventually from COVID, you probably die of bacterial pneumonia. And hospitals have much, much more virulent, dangerous bacteria than you have at home. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.